Liz Crosby Yoga here today with another YouTube video and today I'll be talking a little bit about the number six as we move into 2022 which is the six year and the different archetypal and symbolic ramifications of that number and how we can transmute them. Now, really quickly before we begin, it has been a while since I've posted a video and this video has been really, really resonating with me and I knew I needed to put it out. So it's been a long time and I, I'm sorry, I took a long break. My Instagram got hacked. Liz Crosby Yoga is no longer under my control. I'm glad the hacker hasn't deleted it so those images can inspire people, but I'm now Liz Crosby Metaphysics and I changed my account handle before Metaverse came out. So, uh, you know, it is what it is, but I think it really cuts to the point as to what I am all about. I strive in every way possible to embody and to live in alignment with the universal laws. And it is a process. So back to this YouTube video in particular, six is going to be a big year, right? So 2022 in numerology, we add two plus two plus two, which equals six. And six is associated commonly with fertility, which makes perfect sense because it even looks like a woman about to give birth, right? Carrying child, if you look at the number six. And of course, it sounds a lot like sex, the very number itself. And in some languages, it actually is sex. So of course, in order to give birth, in order to get pregnant, you have to engage in the sexual act. So also worth noting, astrologically, we are moving into Taurus and Scorpio as our north and south node respectively. And of course, Taurus is associated with sensuality and Scorpio sexuality. So <laughs> this is the perfect time to do this video. Also right now it's Sagittarius season and Sagittarius is the philosopher of the zodiac. So perfect time to talk about numerology, astrology, and symbolism also associated with Jupiter, the most expanded gas giant of our solar system, biggest planet. So now is the time to really reflect upon some of these more expanded concepts. So six is associated with sex, sexuality. And in order to conduct Kundalini energy from root to crown chakra, we do need to actually integrate our sexual energy. So in yogic philosophy, we have the yamas, which is the very first limb of yoga. And sometimes it's just left at that and they don't actually explain all five of the yamas. So we have ahimsa, non-harming, satya, truthfulness, astia, non-stealing, brahmacharya, which is the one I want to talk about in relationship to the number six, which is roughly translated, very roughly translated to continents. And even more so, I would even say inaccurately translated to celibacy. Rather, it means Brahma is the God of creation, dwelling in the vastness of creation, in the knowing that all of creation is us. And so therefore, what it really translates to is conserving your sexual energy for spiritual expansion, expansion of spirit, our ability to share spirit with our sphere of existence. And that in and of itself is a sexual act. Right, So that is the merging, the coming together, the union between spirit and matter. So in, instead of repressing our sexual impulse, we're actually utilizing it. We're utilizing it for its divine purpose. And the other one, of course, there are five, is Parigraha, non-hoarding. So I am dishing this information out. I am not hoarding this knowledge. I'm putting it out there on the internet for all to have access to. And so... Sex is also commonly believed to be the original sin. There is never any specification if you do read the Bible. And so it is suggested, but there is still something about that, that our collective consciousness believes the original sin to be sex, right? What is that about? So taking it back to, again, yogic philosophy, one of my favorite yogic philosophers and orators, writers, and just overall amazing spiritual devotee is Yogananda Paramhansa. He is probably most well-renowned for writing Autobiography of a Yogi, which is known for changing lives. If you, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend 
picking that book up and reading it. It's on YouTube too, I believe, so you can literally just listen to it if you drive on a regular basis and you want to have something on. Yogananda in Anubhaga Yogi asks his guru, Sri Yukteswar, what the Genesis creation story is all about. And so he enumerates, Sri Yukteswar explains that the apple also is believed to be what the forbidden fruit is, but it never specifies. So there is something about our collective consciousness that we all intuitively believe it to be an apple. He says that it is usually believed to be an apple because the apple, the forbidden fruit, is symbolic for our electromagnetic field, which is shaped very much like an apple. So we think of our physical bodies, but we don't always think about our energetic bodies. And our energetic body associated with number four, heart chakra, on the hatha, unstruck, is the toroidal flow, the electromagnetic field that our heart space gives off, and it billows out through crown chakra, manifests as our external reality, and then it comes back in and cycles around. So we have the ohas energy of the energy flowing in the outer rim, and then the kundalini energy flowing through the central axis. We have the shishuna channel, which is like the core of the apple. And so when you see it as such, then it becomes abundantly clear that the original sin is not necessarily the sex act. It is more so taking the energy from another person that should be reserved for their own spiritual expansion. And so I'll, I'll, I'll go back to that. I do believe that we can still reroute and reprogram our coming together in relationship in a divine way that actually enriches our ability to conduct energy instead of taking away. And of course, we have Steve Jobs, huge fan of Yogananda. He gave autobiography of Yogi to everyone who attended his funeral service. He has the apple on his products with the bite mark. So it is literally symbolic for how we are utilizing these devices as I am utilizing my Apple phone right now to share information so that we can reboot our own internal programming system, our own inner technology. And so who inspires them to eat the forbidden fruits? Well, it's a snake. Not necessarily the devil, although it is constantly assumed to be the devil. And what else is a snake in yogic philosophy? But the kundalini energy is literally likened to a divine serpent. What isn't discussed, and Sri Yukteswar does mention this, is that the snake becomes increasingly more poisonous because as we move the kundalini energy up the spine until it, it meets all the way up through crown chakra, which is much like a halo, until it connects all the way to source and reaches the collective consciousness, then the external stimulus can become increasingly more alluring and our desires can become increasingly more poisonous, just like a snake can be poisonous when we give in to these desires, these attachments to Maya, which are really just byproducts of our illusions of separateness. And so in order to restabilize, rebalance, and conduct the energy through, we must balance the lovers within, which are the two snakes weaving up the caduceus, if you're familiar with the pharmaceutical industry or the medical industry, you've seen it. The two snakes weaving up the staff is a symbol for our chakra system and also intimating to us how we take care of our chakra system because it is up to us to take care of our chakra system, right? Don't just go and get the uh, picture taken of your aura, but do work on yourself to run that energy all the way through. So now that brings us back to, again, the devil. And I, I've talked a lot about sex and, and how we need to work within ourselves to spiritualize matter and that the divine union is actually happening within. And um, of course, the lovers can also be represented as the masculine and feminine aspects in each chakra and each, each nadi even. But the number six, as we know, is also heavily associated with the devil. And we, we see this because the number 666 is, 666 is so heavily stigmatized in our culture. I want to preface before I dive into the archetype of the devil, Satan, Lucifer, that I myself am more so an academic and I am doing this work to expound upon this archetype so that we can take our power back. So we're not giving our power away to a figment of our imagination, a 
aspect of self that we see reflected back at us from the external, which is really just us reflecting back at us. So when we understand the role that this archetype plays in the alchemical process, we can then take that power back so that we're not giving all of our energy away to the perhaps the greatest scapegoat of all time, right? Literally associated with Capricorn, which is the goat. Yes, you heard me right. Sorry, Capricorns. <laughs> Literally, you guys are associated with the devil card in tarot. Okay, so back to the devil. What does Jesus say to the devil when he's being tempted by the devil in the desert? He says, get behind thee, Satan. And Yogananda also leaning back on Yogananda because he is the man in the second coming of Christ with Emmaus, he discusses what the significance behind that statement is. What is Christ? Christ is Krishna consciousness, Christ Krishna consciousness, or Buddha consciousness, the supreme being, the, the higher intellect, being able to conduct kundalini energy from root to crown chakra uninterrupted without deviation, a perfect connection to crown chakra. And so therefore that it is true. That is how we come to know God is through Christ. And so therefore, what does that make Satan? Satan is an entity or stagnant energy, a illusion of separateness that causes the Kundalini energy or the Holy Spirit to deviate from the central axis, right? The Shashuna channel, the staff and then therefore create an illusion of separateness that is very believable to the mind of the ego that allows us to then create a desire. So an attachment to Maya, an attachment to the hologram. That is what the devil represents. And so there are many possible worlds, infinite possible worlds. And when we are choosing to align with the highest possible world frequency, the highest highest vibrational frequency, our highest self, when we strive to resurrect Christ within us, then we need to say that ourselves, get behind thee, Satan. And of course, law of attraction has become increasingly more powerful and its presence is definitely known in our collective. And I think by now we've all heard of the secret. And, and of course, they talk about vision boards and aligning with the feeling and calling in what it is that you want to manifest in your manifest reality. And we can't just say 10 verbally, right? We have to actually become it with the spine. So the number 10 breaks down into two numbers, a one and a zero. So that is, again, back to the devil card in tarot. It has the two lovers on it with the chains that are loosely bound. So that is symbolic that we are in a prison of our own mind and that if we choose to employ the mental faculties to expand consciousness in each our own sphere and balance the polarities, the masculine and the feminine aspects of self throughout the chakra system, we can free ourselves from this bond. We can, we can free ourselves from these entities that are creating illusions of separateness that keep us bound to the wheel, that keep us stuck in these lower vibrational frequency possible worlds. And so we become both the one and the zero literally in our practice. This is not negating the physical body. And this is really, really important because as we move into 2022, it's time to up-level our comprehension of this symbolism and integrate it. The devil is not something to be feared as something outside of the self. It is us letting us know where we missed a spot in our temple maintenance. And when you see it as such, it can actually help to guide your expansion even more rapidly so that you can ascend at an accelerated rate into Christ consciousness. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, symbol that you see all the time that is representative of the three sixes, which is this symbol. And again, I do believe that it has been largely stigmatized so that we are less inclined to utilize and therefore it slows down our progress. So transmuting through understanding, understanding, overstanding what that symbol actually means because the mudras 
The, the hand gestures are really, really powerful. And so if we have a negative association with a powerful mudra, then that can actually diminish its conductivity, its, its power to liberate our souls. So that is Yana Mudra, right? Which Yana means yoga of the thinking man, which is exactly what we're doing right now, right? We are expounding upon these concepts. And Yana Mudra, this is the three fingers are symbolic for the three gunas. So a guna is a way in which energy flows through nature. And there are three. There are the Tamas gunas, which are earth and water. They're slower moving and they are the most dense. So they are the thought forms that we've inherited from generation to generation in regards to how we project and co-create our shared reality. And they need to be rearranged. We cannot negate them. We cannot pretend like they don't exist, right? The earth element even is matter, which in Latin, matter means mother. So this is our inherited construct. This is also the perfect inventory of all of our karmic debris. And it lets us know exactly what our work is. So we utilize the water element to mold, to shape shift, because once the earth element is wet by the water element, and it becomes this clay so that we can remold ourselves. And again, there we have, again, shape-shifting is also considered to be demonic. This is to be transmuted. We do need to indeed shape-shift. Thus, thus the embodiment of sacred geometry through asana in order to share the body and the blood of Christ. Which brings me to the rajas gunas, which are fire and air. They are transformative, raja meaning royalty. As we invoke the rajas gunas, it allows us to unearth our royalty, right? And Christ blesses with fire. And so as we expand consciousness by holding ever more complex sacred geometric form, the fire is picked up by the air element and it is then transported through the cardiovascular system, the body and the blood, so that we can illuminate space. I like to joke, it's the real love and light. So we are actually illuminating new space as we expand into deeper depths of being in all orientations with respect due to gravity. And that's why it's important to continue to expand upon your asana practice. It doesn't have to be huge leaps and bounds. In fact, it probably shouldn't be quantum leaps. We want to take it nice and slow and enjoy this process. But the air element doubles as both a rajas guna and a sattvic guna because it not only feeds the fire, fire needs air to breathe, and it also transports the fire so that the fire can do its work to burn away the impurities so that we can slowly chisel away and dissolve those entities that create deviations. Uh, but also the air creates a sound. As the air travels through the throat, it creates a sound, and that sound is very revealing. And we have, this is, this is so, so crucial this is why I'm putting out this video, 2022, it's a six year, and we're, we're up at number five, we're almost at number six. So we taste the breath, we smell the breath, we hear the breath, we feel the breath, all of these senses withdrawing inwards so that we can give those karmas, that stagnant energy in each, our field of consciousness, its due process. We can lovingly appreciate it for the service that it fulfilled and getting us to do the Tandamba dance, to hold that space, to illuminate that darkness. And then, of course, if we are playing our cards right, which we are because we know better, so we do better. If we're engaging the bandhas, the energy locks, which is our central core, we are running a current of energy through the spinal column and third eye is activating. The projector is on and we're pressing the tongue into the roof of the mouth so that the air element can go up through the throat and straight up to third eye for witnessing and processing because of course the air element is like a film reel, it conveys information, then we can actually see how those distortions caused unnecessary pain and suffering throughout the ages, throughout our past lives, throughout our ancestral history, and also how as we destroy that entity and allow it to allocate back into oneness, we can be free from that attachment to Maya, right? Slowly breaking free from the cycle of suffering, one karma at a time, and in so doing, enjoying the whole process. And finally, crown chakra, Sahasrara, thousand petal lotus is thought. So all of these elements are varying densities of thought. And we create all of our thoughts with light, 
and then variant densities of light and so on and so forth. So we know our work, we can disentangle ourselves from these lower vibrational frequency possible worlds that we currently reside in. We can shift the paradigm, but it has to happen within. And so now as again, we move from Gemini Sagittarius, I really wanted to get this video out so we could intellectually process this because as we start moving more energy, we're all going to start feeling it, right? That sensuality of Taurus North Node and that sexuality of Scorpio South Node. We're going to start feeling how repressing sexual energy and stigmatizing it has left us barren, has left us in these lower vibrational frequency states, seemingly unable to elevate. And as we start to run this energy, it is going to feel increasingly more blissful. So this is another big reason why I had to get this video out is I know for a fact that I have already begun to shock depot with certain individuals that I hold very dear to me. We've had many, many in encounters in the past and we've worked together steadily throughout time to arrive at the ability to experience Shakti Pat with each other. But I know there will come a time when I'm running so much Kundalini energy that I will be able to Shakti Pat significantly more people. And it is a matter of time because we are slowly rearranging the elements for the benefit of all beings. Om Gam Ganapate Namaha, I am Ganesha and so are you. If you choose to rearrange your gunas for the benefit of all beings, gunas plus isha, which is short for Ishvara Prana Dhamat, the fifth niyama, inward observance. And the energy is going to become such that if you come within a certain distance, proximity, you will feel an invocation of the kundalini energy. You will feel something stir within you and move steadily up your spine. And it may feel like greater bliss than you've experienced in a really, really long time. So I am a huge advocate for consent, obviously. And I would just like to let people know that that is potentially going to be a part of my reality and I am okay with it. I've definitely come to terms with it. I've discussed this before with friends, right? If, uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? I, I would venture to guess that very few people would say to be able to give people full body orgasms, you know? And, and also while from a distance, all of us keeping our clothes on, like it's not something I had intended. This is something I leaned into as I have been doing for years now, letting go of my own egoic plan and trusting in the divine plan. And the universe is not without a sense of humor. <laughs> so I am really looking forward to it. Of course, I'm already aligning with the frequency because that's how we bring it into our reality. And I am so, so looking forward to this year. Uranus is in Taurus until 2026, but I really feel like in 2022, we're going to get another really epic wave of front runners leading us as a collective into the great purge, into the great awakening, into the ascension for real. And we're all going to have such a good time while doing it. It's going to be so much fun. So get your environment in order and make sure that you have a space where you can continue to expand consciousness on a regular basis. Remember that Uranus is Father Sky associated with Aquarius, which is fixed air. Taurus is fixed earth. And so in order to truly reactivate the nadis, the tubular channels that life force energy flows through, we do need to get that sacred fire, right? Bless it with fire first. We have to get that sacred fire there and it hitches a ride through the cardiovascular system. So we do have to get the earth element there by physically embodying sacred geometry. And it is also of great importance to remember to get upside down, right? We need to get upside down, and this is what I've been joking, that we have to get our anus up in the sky, right? Our anus, Uranus, sky god. Yeah, so get upside down, because in order to cleanse the uppermost chakras, we do need to run fire through them. And the fire from, comes from solar plexus, third chakra. It goes 
towards the foundation. So whatever you make the foundation, that's where the fire will flow. And it makes sense in terms of physics because of the rooting and rebounding forces and the internal body heat that is created as a byproduct. So headstand, foreign balance, handstand. You can also do legs up against the wall or just lie over the side of a couch. Wherever you are in your practice, work from where you're at. Honor your body. But again, it is time to start getting upside down so that the uppermost chakras can truly activate while we are doing this work, while we are expanding consciousness in the sphere so that we can meditate while we're practicing asana upon these distortions and how they cause the kundalini energy to deviate and all of the repercussions that follow suit as a byproduct of that distortion. So get upside down. Expect a lot more videos from me on this channel and uh, I will be teaching a lot more tutorials in the way of inversions and arm balances so that we can rebuild the divine masculine. And yes, I do believe we can still come together in a romantic relationship and instead of biting each other's apples, which is essentially energetic vampirism, instead of stealing energy from each other, we can actually amplify each other's currents. Can you imagine? Imagine? It's going to be so good. I'm so excited. So hit me up if you are local and you would like any um, training in the way of inversions or if you'd like to, even if you don't have a significant other, maybe you've got some flatmates, if you'd like to learn acro, let me know. Uh, I would also like to make it again abundantly clear. I have to reaffirm this over and over and over again. I am a brahmachari and so I am conserving all of my energy for expansion and I am treating everyone as my soulmate so that we can, all of us, expand as much as humanly possible. And if I'm meant to start dating again, I will definitely let you guys know, but right now I am very clear. I have very, very intuitive uh, abilities and I trust in my, in my intuition. So I'm going to remain single for at least a little bit more so that we can really, really make sure that the paradigm gets truly shifting. And with perfect love and perfect trust, I love you all as the same self. I hope that this video was revelatory and I am so looking forward to transmuting these energies and seeing how far we can go as we move into 2022. And again, the hair is purple. I did the hair purple for this video. And it's been purple for so long because I keep putting this video off, but I did it, I finally did it. So I might change to a different color, but again, purple is the color of third eye, which is the sixth chakra. So we are going to be steeping in that energy of six for a whole 365 days. So again, third eye is so, so important to activate get upside down, learn how to engage your bandhas. We will be going over it in our classes as we move into 2022 together. I will help you to establish a kundalini hard line all the way up through the spine and up to crown so that you can full send those karmas and process them with third eye activation. It's gonna be a kundalini tidal wave for the collective. So get excited and I will talk to you next time. Have a lovely day and namaste, satnam, aho.